And the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. On the first day of the week, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And Jesus asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart. To believe all the prophets have declared, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. And as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus and he vanished from their sight. And the two disciples said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and while he was opening up the scriptures to us? In that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. And these were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. And then the two disciples told what had happened on the road and how the Lord had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And this is the gospel of the Lord. I must tell you that every time I read this particular passage or hear it, it reminds me of something that happened some 15 years ago, so bear with me. At that particular time, I, had, I was director of a center, the Inter-American Cooperative Institute in Central America. It's a regional tra training center founded by one of our priests, Father Harvey Steele, a Cape Bretoner with a strong commitment to the poor and to justice. And Father Harvey, like so many who grew up in rural Nova Scotia in the 90s and 1920s and 30s, was highly influenced by two priests, Monsignor Moses Cody and Father Jimmy Tompkins, the founders of what we refer to as the Antigonish movement. The Antigonish movement evolved in those years and began with local community development. The work that they started originated as a response to poverty, the poverty of the miners, the fishermen, the farmers, and many people who were economically disadvantaged. The Monsignor Cody and his associates used a very practical method and a successful strategy of adult education and group action that began with the immediate economic needs of the local people. Father Steele, who was better known in Latin America where he worked as Padre Pablo, was guided by the principles of the movement and promoted credit unions and cooperatives while he worked in the Dominican Republic but then he came to a point where he was threatened and he had to leave. But he maintained the vision of always creating a center that would be for Latin Americans to help Latin Americans and it would be based on the Antigonish movement. That reality or that vision became a reality in 1964 
when the Inter-American Cooperative Institute was founded. In 1988, I was named as director, and I was there for about 10 years. And the incident I recall took place in 1994. It was the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Institute. And I remember thinking at the time, feeling very good about the work it was doing, but beginning to feel more and more uncomfortable that a Canadian was serving as a director of a center for Latin Americans, and it should be in the hands of Latin Americans who should be directing their own center. And I can remember a Friday evening, vividly uh, that I recall, sitting on the balcony, thinking about how I could bring this about and how it should come about. And as I was sitting there, I remember the people from down below were coming in for a workshop on the pedagogy of Jesus, and somebody called down to me to go down and meet this Mexican theologian who was coming in to give the workshop. He remembered some of our people, and we had a great chat, and he said, why don't you join us tomorrow? So I did. And I went in, and in the course of the morning, we were divided into groups of five or six, and each one of us at mid-morning was given a text from the gospel to reflect on the characteristics of the pedagogy of Jesus. I ended up in a group with six others, and the text we were given was the disciples on the road to Emmaus. I remember people commenting about Jesus and how he took people where they were at. He simply arrived, and that was not totally unexpected. That was very typical of that time, the customs and the culture, that he just joined in in the conversation. But what I recall very much is that Jesus didn't begin to speak. He let people say and relate their whole story. Then he began to spoke, to speak rather. He respected fully and he began to, he picked up where people were at. And people offered their own comments, but what it struck me was a woman who was sitting on my left, just out of the blue. She said, and he knew when to leave. And I, I did a double take and I looked at her and I said, pardon? She said, he knew when to leave. And I said, exactly what do you mean? She said, well, it's like a parent. You know it's time to come to trust. You have to let them grow in maturity. And that was the same thing with Jesus. It's the beginning of a mutual relationship of trust. Trust the disciples and invite them to trust in God so that they move forward. I knew I had the answer right then and there to my, to my prayer and to my, my quandary about appointing a director and moving on. For me, it was abundantly clear. I think that it's always helpful when we look and we recognize that in the stranger, in Jesus, the death of Jesus was seen as the achievement of his mission. It was not the collapse of it. He needed and he invited people to look beyond the past, and he invites us to look beyond the past, to interpret the past in light of the present, interpret the past in the light of the resurrection and the presence of the risen Lord with us. Please stand. As we gather this day, we remember those who join us via television and the many intentions that they've asked that we remember. For them and for those intentions, we pray to the Lord. Lord. And we pray this day that we have the gift to be peacemakers in our homes, in our communities, in our places of work. For that grace for each of us, we pray to the Lord. Lord. And for the many people who join us from hospitals, seniors' homes, that God will be, continue to bless them in all that they do and grant them health and grant them well-being. For all of them, we pray to the Lord. Lord in all of this we ask through Christ our Lord.